everyone, I'm here in Chicago today and uh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, another friend of mine. This is uh, Jeff Swanson. Now, Jeff is uh, an expert in systematic trading. It's an area of trading that uh, I know pretty little about and uh, he knows a lot about. And before I ask Jeff to share with us some of the, uh, the pearls of wisdom that I know that he's, uh, he's got lined up for us today, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, what, what Jeff does. Now, Jeff has got a very successful, very well uh, used website, um, and uh, it's called systemtradersuccess.com, and you can, go and, uh, you can go and look that up and, and read all about Jeff and, and what he's up to. Now, interesting thing is um, I told some of my colleagues that I was going to meet Jeff today, mm -hmm. and somebody sent me a private message saying, when you see Jeff, tell him he has got the best blog out there on the internet on systematic trading. To which I replied, don't let me tell him. <laughs> email him directly because he, he'd like to I'll look for that email. email. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but genuinely, if systematic trading is your thing, um, the amount you can learn from, from this guy and all the information on his website is it's just unbelievable. So, um, well, thanks, good. Simon. I really appreciate that. I mean, this is the first time we've personally met, and yes, it is. Uh, it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It has. And um, now I know you're going to tell us something about uh, 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 part of systematic trading which trips an awful lot of people up. Sure. Which is uh, well, I'll let you get on with it. Okay? Sure. Rather than me try and uh, guess what you're going to say. Because yeah, this you, is really important. Yeah, you know, system trading is is a lot different, obviously, than discretionary trading. But there's a lot of overlap and. Probably though, a concept that comes up a lot with uh, people that are trying to build systems. It's so easy to build a system on, on historical data mm -hmm. and get that pretty looking equity curve that just climbs and climbs. But what, when it goes to the live market, crash and burn. And so what we call that is overfitting or mm -hmm. over optimization, uh, the terms that are used. And what that means is basically built an automated trading system tailored to the historical data. And it's so tailored to the data, it's actually not picking up on your market edge. It's actually just keying in on noise in the market. And so as soon as you go to the live market, your equity curve crashes. And that's a real problem for uh, a lot of people. And that's probably one of my top three issues that people come to me. Yeah. And well, I've come up with a, a couple steps that I personally use to help mitigate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, what I do is, um, when you're optimi optimizing, now optimization for people that may not know is uh, when you, let's say you have a very simple trading system that has four inputs and they might be the look back period of a moving average or a, a, a period of inside of an RSI indicator and these generate buy and sell signals on the, uh, for the system. And what people will do is they want to optimize that to the, uh, to the historical data and that, that's not bad. You, you, you want to do that. We all do that. We all recur or I should say we all depend on historical patterns reoccurring in the market so we can take advantage of them. But the problem is they do it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Now what typically what people will do is they'll go in and optimize that first parameter. Let's say it's that uh, 200 period moving average and they want to test that uh, in the historical market. So they'll go through and use uh, optimization and they'll test values let's say from 10 to 200 in increments of 10 and you'll get kind of like a histogram. So, you know, what is the performance at 10? What is it at 20 period? What is it at 50? And you'll kind of get this graph. And what they'll do is, oh yeah, look at that one. That one value created the best, best um, uh, return. Yeah. So we're going to grab that one and plug that into our system. And then what they'll do is do that for the other four, three different parameters. So they're creating all these graphs and they're grabbing that best value for all of them. And so what you're doing is you're completely over optimizing your system to the historical data. Yeah. The point there is you do not want to grab the best value. Where ideally what you'll want to look for is when you do one of those um, optimizations, what you're going to do is you're going to run through your test, you're going to do 10 through 200 in increments of 10, and you'll want to find like a stable range. And what that will show you is that uh, at that stable range, um, there's a lot of robustness, I like to say, in the input. Yep. So it's not just keying off of one value. Mm -hmm. 
then mm -hmm. it's like a fluke or an outlier, what we call. Yep. And so it's not an outlier, and so we have a stable range which shows robustness, and that's a really good sign. So what I'll do is maybe take the lower end of that range and then the higher end of that range and just average or mean it and use that as a value. Then I'll set that aside, okay, and this is really important. I'll set it aside and then go and optimize the other values independently of the first. I call this independent optimization. What most people do is they'll combine, combine them. And what I mean is they'll take that one big value or that optimal value on that first input and then they'll go to the second input and optimize it with that first one optimized. Yeah. So, so you really, end up with all four of them, yeah. you've taken the best number for each of your four sure. inputs, so you've absolutely honed this yep. to represent perfectly the performance based on all that historic data. Right. Exactly. But then you set yourself up for the fall just by like, exactly. picking that one brilliant number for each right. of the four inputs. Right. So if you go ahead and pick a, uh, pick a range of values yeah. and pick a medium value, never the best one, mm -hmm. and then do that individually for the other input values, you go a long way to avoiding uh, curve fitting. And yeah. that's what I tell everybody, uh, uh, to, you, you know, you've got to do that okay. because it'll go a long way. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I've been there in the past when I've been trying to develop yep. uh, mechanical systems. And uh, you know, I've fallen into that trap. And oh yeah, I, it's easy to do. Oh yeah, and I've never really, I've never really worked my way through that because obviously uh, most of my work is discretionary now anyway. Um, but I have been there, done that, and fallen into exactly those traps. Sure, I think we all have. I know I personally have. Sometimes I'll get excited about, wow, look how great that equity curve looks, you know, and, and then I'll know I wasn't as careful as I should have been. Yeah. On those inputs, so yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the other thing that, uh, that I've noticed on occasions when I've done some of this testing is that uh, let's say you've got your four inputs and uh, for three of them you, you end up with this kind of, not necessarily a bell curve, but a range of, of, of values of the input that, uh, that give you acceptable performance. Right. Obviously within any sample there's always going to be one number right. that's got the best by right. definition. But if you've got that range on three of the inputs and your fourth input, you find there is one number that sticks out, yeah. and it and that's the number that works, and everything around it is just terrible. I mean, that's a real warning sign. That's a real warning sign. Yeah, I'd call that an outlier. When one clearly sticks out as a as a you know a clear winner, mm -hmm. I would avoid that you know, like a plague. That because that's just it's not it's likely to repeat. Yeah. Oh, it's not likely, excuse me, to to repeat into the future. It's just not. It's, you're just going to set yourself up for failure with that. And, and so if you have that situation where you've got a mm -hmm. range on, say, three of your four inputs, yeah. and input number four has got this, this mm. uh, precarious spike on the, on the yes. curve, what, what, what would you recommend people do That's in that That's a good question. Uh, well, depending on really what that looks like, is that spike maybe surrounded by a more stable region? Um, that's possible, and then maybe what you do is go off that spike mm -hmm. and take another value. Um, occasionally, you will come across a system where it's really just one value, and the others just dramatically zero. fall. Yeah, maybe not zero, but dramatically fall down. You can see that the performance of the system dramatically falls. It's a sharp curve, a sharp edge. You might either have to get rid of that input value. Is mm -hmm. it really critical? Is it adding value to your system? And if it is. That system may be broken, yeah. and you may not want to trade it. Yeah, and at the end of the day, we all know that to actually find systems that that will work, that, that work both on historic data and moving forward, you actually have to do a lot of work and a lot of testing, and Why you have to testing? be prepared to throw an awful lot of stuff away yeah. until you actually home in on on a small number of things that work really well. I always say this: it's you got to have perseverance because perseverance, excuse me, because most of your ideas. They're just not going to work. Yeah. They're not going to work, and you're going to have to throw it away. And that's hard to do. Who likes to be in a business? I always say this to people, too. Who wants to be in a business where most of your ideas don't work? Mm -hmm. That's not fun. But, yeah, that's what you got to do. Yeah. yeah. You just got to go under the mindset that most of these things aren't going to work. Yeah. Okay, that's great, Jeff. I've got one question. Sure. Um, uh, which is kind of related to this. I don't know the answer. Maybe you know. I don't know, but I'm going to ask you. Sure. Right um, when you're designing a, um, a strategy that's got a series of inputs, you've done your optimization and you found these range, ranges and you found stable ranges, and you've basically got a system that you think 
actually, this looks to me like it's credible. Um, the, the, I suppose that the question that, that now goes through my mind is, do you believe that systems should be tailored to individual markets, or would you then take that system and say, now I'm going to apply that to data from a different market right. and expect a similar range of, right. of, of stability or, or not? How do you feel about that? I would say it's when you have a system and you're tailoring it to a specific market, it doesn't necessarily have to work well in other markets. Obviously, though, let's say if you're doing something for the S&P. Mm -hmm. um, when I did develop something for the S&P, I would expect it to do okay on the Dow, NASDAQ, you know, the other broad market indexes. Yeah. I wouldn't expect it to do well on Apple, okay. a stock you know, uh, like that, or any stock for that matter. So what I would say is you really... You <laughs> See, we're in a real trading room here. <laughs> that doesn't sound good. Um, basically, so it's kind of yes and no. If you're doing a broad market type index, yeah, it should, it should work. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to be as spectacular, but it should, certainly shouldn't fall apart. And this is interesting. This brings up another point which you can do with computers nowadays when you're optimizing. This is a more advanced technique. Mm -hmm. What I told, uh, what we just went over with optimization was kind of a, a basic technique that everyone should be doing. And then as you get familiar with that, uh, and you get familiar with your trading development platform, let's say you're doing something for the S&P, and you're optimizing those four values. Well, okay. you're not going to just do it over one market. Mm -hmm. You're going to optimize uh, with all those markets, the NASDAQ, the Dow, and say the Russell. Yeah. And so then what you're going to do is further distance yourself from possible over-optimization, because it works generally on all of these markets. Mm -hmm. So, and all those markets are relatively correlated, as we know. So, yeah. your system logically should work on those. So, that's a long answer to your... No, that's great, because I think effectively what you're saying is, um, which is what I tell people to do with, with all types of trading, which is actually drill back down to the basic premise of the strategy. Mm. Yep. And what you're saying is, look, if it works on the S&P, but it's terrible on the NASDAQ or the Dow, there's a warning sign. That's a red flag. Yeah. yeah. So if, 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 if the premise is based upon um, you know, things you're expecting to happen in an index type market, right. then it should actually perform reasonably well right. um, in other similar types of markets. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Whereas if you were to say, take that strategy and try and apply it to soybeans or something, there's no reason necessarily why there's it no real at all. Right. Yeah. Totally run by different fundamentals and yeah. different market participants. Okay. Yep. Great. Jeff, it's been a blast to have you here today. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you so much for sharing this with everyone. It's all my pleasure. Okay, great. See you again. Take care. Thanks. Bye.